Thank you. Uh, hopefully I can live up to that. And, and I haven't updated my bio on the website in quite a while. It's been a little more than 14 years, but uh, we won't say how long. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about what the Toxics Use Reduction Program is about so you know where our perspective is, is and uh, then talk about perchloroethylene and uh, hexavalent chromium. Uh, so these are not emerging hazards. These are very, uh, we'll say they're very existing chemicals. So how many of you have ever worked on either perk or hexavalent chromium? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Okay. So they're not new hazards, but they're still being used, widely used, and uh, and there are needs out there. Um, so the the TUR program is a little bit different than many environmental programs. One of the main goals of the law was to promote, sustain, and promote the competitive position of Massachusetts industry, along with reducing their use of toxic chemicals. So uh, businesses are required every other year to analyze their use of toxic chemicals and see what options they might have for reducing their use and their waste and to assess those options. Uh, they're not required to implement anything, only if it makes sense for them, but they're required to do that assessment. Um, there all, there's also a right to know provision where they have to report their chemical use, which uh, assists us in knowing where to focus. Um, so the information that Turi provides to all these companies, the, the program consists of, of our institute at UMass Lowell and an Office of Technical Assistance that provides direct on-site technical assistance and then the regulatory portion. So our role in the program is to provide uh, information and training and general assistance to companies. Um, we provide grants and, and support uh, research and academia to, to help connect the needs of businesses with the capacity we have in academia to address those problems. Um, the, the information that we provide, we try to, you know, there's a lot of talk yesterday about right sizing and, and trying to focus the information uh, properly. So, uh, so the decision makers that we tend to be trying to reach are manufacturers or businesses, small businesses, uh, community groups, um, uh, folks like that. And so we need to, in fact, tailor the information we provide to that audience when we go to make decisions on, on what chemicals should be in the list of the program or should be prioritized. Then, of course, we make a much deeper dive. Our science advisory board requires uh, extensive information to, to uh, make those kinds of decisions. Um, so uh, we're also the science and policy arm of the program. And so I just wanted to give you a quick example of uh, some of the policy work that we have done. Uh, I knew I was going to be here at the Institute of Medicine and thought I should bring up something more health focused. So, um, so I have copies of these recent reports. Uh, we tried to take a look at the chemicals used in Massachusetts from our data that are carcinogens for various different cancer sites, so for example, liver carcinogens, et cetera, and we analyzed that data for use and emissions, and then we also looked at some of the cancer statistics. So the objective was not to try to link those two things and say trends are going this way, so trends will go this way for the other. It was really to educate our toxics use reduction planners who are doing those assessments for companies about what the health uh, risks are of the various chemicals they use and to educate the uh, cancer industry and the cancer researchers and everyone about what the chemicals are being used in industry that might affect cancer rates. So it was a very much a sort of informing each group. Uh, we also did one on asthmogens and so uh, those are on our website and I do have a copy of the carcinogen one with me if you're interested. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief case study on perchloroethylene in, used in dry cleaning. Um, it's used very widely in Massachusetts and I think in all states uh, for dry cleaning. It's also used in industrial vapor degreasing and in some uh, products still for consumers and small businesses like brake cleaners. Uh, I'm not going to go over the hazards because I saw lots of hands up. Um, it is reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen. It's a neurotoxin, has a, a variety of other uh, health effects. Um, whoops. There we go. So, uh, this is the alternatives assessment uh, general model we tend to use. We developed it in conjunction with the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse, IC2, which was mentioned yesterday. Uh, and it basically is just defines this process of identifying the chemicals of high concern, identifying the alternatives to those chemicals, um, which might be chemical material product or other, other ways of uh, satisfying whatever functional need. 
um, prioritizing and then doing an assessment that includes a technical and performance assessment as well as an environmental health and safety assessment which might be done for example by the green screen uh, tool for, uh, for, the, um, for a chemical to chemical transition. Um, and then looking as much as we can at financial assessment. We often don't have that kind of information and so that needs to be uh, left up to companies to do, but we provide what we have. Um, and then we need to analyze the information and get companies to do something with it. Um, so for PERC, it is a higher hazard substance in Massachusetts. Uh, that means its reporting threshold is only 1,000 pounds instead of 10,000 for the way that it's used. Um, we decided, uh, the program decided to focus on dry cleaning. Uh, this is a use of a very toxic chemical that is pervasive in small businesses where the, the users may not be very sophisticated about using toxic chemicals and uh, it, it seemed like a, an excellent place to focus. Um, so we identified the, the many alternatives available for perk and dry cleaning. We reviewed their technical performance and uh, again assessed the, in, in a fairly general way, we didn't do green screens, assessed the uh, environmental health and safety and costs and, uh, and then presented that information for dry cleaners to use. So again, here we're trying to right size this. You know, we could have given them lots and lots of information. We boiled it down to this one, you know, double-sided sheet. Um, with what we felt were the key indicators, some of which you see up there. So across the top are the, the alternatives that we assessed. Um, the color coding is just on the environmental health and safety characteristic, not on the performance and cost end. Um, but you'll notice that on the far right, there's n-propyl bromide. And that is a chemical that, that in our process would be screened out in that initial screening. Um, N-propyl bromide is, is an available substitute for chlorinated solvents. It is not regulated uh, substantially at all. Uh, it, it's regulated under TORA in, in Massachusetts, but that's not much. Um, all that is is guidance and reporting. Um, so companies feel like it's not a hazardous air pollutant, it's not a hazardous waste. I, it's safe, it's got to be, or the government would regulate it, right? Um, well, it's not, and EPA has not for 15 years managed to get it regulated. And uh, that's a topic for another talk. Um, meanwhile, we, we included it here because dry cleaners are being, uh, you know, sold this material by their vendors saying this is a drop-in substitute. You just have to change your seals. It'll be great. It'll be cheap. It'll be easy. So we included it here to try to make sure that they were informed before they did that substitution. Um, some of the other chemicals you see up there, like siloxanes, didn't rank as well because there's still some data gaps. Our science advisory board has some lingering concerns that uh, haven't been answered. So, um, so all of this is, I guess, guess, a bit in play if things, um, information should change. But on the far left, you see wet cleaning. So zoom right in on that. So what is professional wet cleaning? It's using computer controlled equipment and very little water, special detergent packages, uh, removing the clothes from the dryer before they're quite dry, and then using special finishing and tensioning equipment, which reshapes and, and does an awesome job. You have not lived until you've seen a pants topper. This is a piece of equipment that holds your pants up, clips the cuffs, and fills it with steam and air, and you know, it's, it's just, it's very Im impressive. <laughs> This is, this is to stimulate, <laughs> that could be fun, but you think it would be a little hot. <laughs> no, you're not in the pants, but it looks really cool. And they're doing that right here to these jackets that you see. They're, they're sort of blowing them up and, and reshaping them. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very neat process to watch. We have 11 uh, dedicated wet cleaners, as we call them in Massachusetts now. I will give full credit to California from whence we got this initial idea uh, many years ago, and California has really taken it and run with it, and so we have sort of a bi-coastal thing going on there. Um, but wet cleaning saves energy. We have uh, like eight case studies. I have some of those with me, but it saves energy. It saves money. It saves, uh, often saves water because they're using more efficient equipment, um, and, and the quality has equaled that of PERC. So my favorite quote is the shortest one, which is Ernie Barbados. He says, I wish I knew then what I know now. So our job is to get all the other dry cleaners to know now what Ernie Barbado knows. So we have demonstrations and we invite people in and, and, and there are you know, other cleaners in. They get to kind of kick the tires on the equipment, try it out, see how it works. 
Um, so the second uh, case study, again, to stimulate the latent engineer in all of you, we're going to talk about hexavalent chromium. Um, it is still widely used for corrosion protection. It does a really, really good job. All these toxic chemicals the companies use, they don't just use them because they, you know, happen to have them around. They all do a really good job. Hex chrome is one of those. It's used in, in sealants, primers, and conversion coatings when you go to assemble uh, metal products. I'm not going to, again, dwell on the uh, health effects, but it's a group one carcinogen and, and has many other known health effects. There are a lot of drivers for change. The one that is driving the particular supply chain work group that we're working with is the DFARS, um, the uh, Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, which is uh, the, our federal government. DOD isn't always on the forefront. But in this case, they really are doing a, a very good job to try to stimulate industry to come up with alternatives and to get those through the approval process, which, as I'm sure you know, is no small feat uh, through DOD. Um, so our supply chain work group for this uh, particular project includes a lot of the uh, defense uh, agencies as well as contractors. Um, and in addition to this particular driver, there are drivers from Europe, uh, the end-of-life vehicle directive and the restriction on hazardous substances and electrical equipment and electronics. Those are all restricting hot chrome. So it's got a, a number of different uh, directions pushing in the other direction. Um, so this is a quick uh, schematic of the cross-section of an aluminum substrate with a conversion coating and a sealant and primer and then a top coat. So what DFARS is aiming for is to eliminate all but the conversion coating hexavalent chromium. And, uh, and then ultimately, uh, we hope to get everyone to a completely hex chrome and reliable um, surface. This is a quick picture of the uh, research pro project that has been uh, drummed up by these uh, this supply chain work group, and we are about halfway through that. It pulls resources from a lot of different companies, and we couldn't do it without all those resources. They end up putting in millions of dollars worth of time in terms of uh, fabricating things and, and uh, testing things. So some of those organizations are shown here. The uh, middle picture up there is the uh, test vehicle. Uh, they also put funding into doing the testing and long-term and short-term corrosion testing. Uh, Turi does the statistical analysis and, and tries to write things up for everybody. And again, just as fun to look at, uh, Greg Morose, who runs this project for Turi, said everyone likes to look at projects, at, at the pictures where it didn't go so well, as opposed to the ones where it just looks nice. So this top set is definitely one where it didn't go so well. We were testing a whole variety of, of different combinations of, of uh, conversion coating being hexavalent chromium or not, and primer being hexavalent chromium or not, sealant, et cetera. So uh, they had a huge design of experiments, and uh, that particular combination did not do so well. One on the bottom, the fang surfaces are, are quite a bit uh, better protected and, and clean. Um, and that information is being uh, sort of analyzed now and will be out sometime soon. So to summarize that, the, uh, the supply chain work group we have for aerospace and defense, it includes the, the DOD, the OEMs, um, component and material suppliers, the metal finishers, uh, and, and actually the metal finishers, which are sort of at the bottom of that supply chain, uh, have a much harder time meeting some of these requirements, and they don't necessarily get a lot of assistance. Their customer will say, you know, I want a hex chrome free finish on that, but they don't necessarily give them all the technical assistance they need uh, to provide that. And so part of this project is to bring the supply chain together so that the metal finishers get to talk to you know, their OEMs in a less threatening environment than uh, customer to supplier and, and make those points made. We had a meeting recently where they got to do that. And you hear a lot of resistance from the metal finishers. You know, these products have worked well for them for a long time, and they're very resistant to change. So getting that whole machine moving is quite a, a job. In many cases, it requires mill spec changes. Um, and there's certainly a lot more research to be done as well. So we've been working on the sealants, but 
we want to make sure that the sealant removers, whatever they're using to take those sealants off, you know, is not methylene chloride or something. So we need to research those or doing that. And, and we want to get uh, more into the primers and conversion coatings. We want to make sure that we don't do a regrettable substitution with companies. Uh, so we are doing alternatives assessments on various applications for hex chrome. Um, some of the alternatives are other metals, other metals like nickel, which um, I, if I asked for a show of hands, I'm sure I get a lot more of those as well. That also has a lot of issues, um, but, uh, but we're trying to make forward progress. So in summary, our objective is to eliminate the hazard, adopt safer alternatives where they're available, uh, to do alternatives assessments, to avoid regrettable substitutions, and to form these collaborations and partnerships with companies so that the supply chains can benefit from that assistance and, and all the things that you just heard from David as well about getting a group together in a sort of non-threatening environment where there are things that they can share. Um, and, and the companies and, and those supply chains really benefit from the assistance. So, so thank you. And I did ask a number of questions yesterday, and I really appreciate the invitation. It's been a fascinating discussion. I appreciate it. Okay, so we covered sort of, uh, you know, supply chain chemicals and institutional changes and products in the home. We would be remiss if we didn't actually worry about or think about where we work and live. And that's the subject of our last speaker, Joseph David. He is a sustainability program manager at Point32, a real estate company in Seattle focusing on land use development and construction. David is leading, is leading Point 32's effort to secure the Living Building Challenge certification for the Bullet Center and has spearheaded efforts to design a vetting process for meeting the strict material red list exclusion requirements. 